Hey guys, welcome to episode two of Between the Lanes. I'm Ralph, and he's Ron, and thank everybody for tuning in. Um, to start off, I definitely want to thank all you guys who tuned in last week for our first episode. The amount of uh, positive feedback and the thank yous Ron and I both received was very overwhelming and definitely more than expected. We do know that last week's episode was a little bit long, and that was not on purpose. It was just our first time, and we started talking, and, and by the time we were done, we went a little long, but we figured we'd just keep it and see how it went. But tonight, we want to try to shorten up a little bit, keep it eh, like an hour or less, right? Yep, exactly. Okay. All right. Before we get started on tonight's content, Ron has a couple things he wants to clean up from last week. Yeah, last week we talked, you know, about several things. Um, we did have one writer, viewer, write in and say they disagreed with our dyno. That's okay, fine, you can disagree, but if it works for you, use it. Like I said, nothing good, nothing bad about dynos. So, and then I also said there was only two king tracks in California. And right. you wrote in and said, no, you forgot one. So a shout out to uh, Eddie, Eddie's Raceway, which is owned by Eddie Wong in Vallejo, California. He has a Blue King track, and then he has a road course, which I believe is called the Purple Angel. But I'm not 100% sure on that. But he's got a pretty wild road course, and Eddie's been a raceway owner now probably for close to 20 years. Okay, cool. It's, you were going to say something? No, I just said cool. Okay. That's, that's, cool. that's cool to hear when you hear raceways being around that long, you know? Right, yeah. yeah. And um, we talked about the Sano race and the, the, the points and all that. That only happened at the first two Sanos. And, and when it comes to the spec race at the Sano, they started it with the second Sano, and Ricky D was the winner. And the, the third year, Sano 3, was Howie. The year following that, number four was you, Ralph. I was number five, and then the last uh, Sano they ran spec cars at was Sano six, and they had the spec and the super spec, and Brian Cox won spec, and Wes P won the super spec race. Okay, gotcha. And um, we also talked about guide flight, or not guide flights, we talked about braid and braid pricing. So I went to the calculator, inflation calculator, and braid was – 35 cents a pair from basically the 60s up until, well, a few years ago or whatever, 10 years ago. And it was 35 cents when I started in 81. It was 35 cents in the 60s. So if you go back to the 69 price and, 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 and calculate it, it comes out to $2.41 a pair today. Hmm. Now, to put that into comparison, when I started racing, 16D motors were $6 retail, which today would be $16.88. Bodies back in the 60s were $1.49. Today's prices, they'd be $12.31. So there's, that's a big difference. Yeah, definitely. And bodies. tires in 81 were 4 bucks a pair, which would be eleven twenty five today. So just some more little tidbits of that. And um, shout-outs, uh, Ross Scharf, Ohio slot car racer, uh, he broke his leg this last weekend in a motocross uh, a motorcycle. Uh, I don't know if he was racing or just out riding, but somebody broke his leg, and now he's got metal on his leg. And hmm. Get well, Ross. Slot cars are safer than motorbikes. Yeah, definitely Ross is a good friend of a lot of people who tune in the show. So definitely, Ross, hope you get better soon. Get healed up, man. Yep, and see you soon in a race and probably on crutches. But anyway <laughs> – and then in a sad, uh, sad uh, moment, uh, Wendell Webster passed away in the last few days. Wendell was a drag racer that I know of, and he raced uh, out of Tennessee, Tracy Brown's place, and uh, uh, he'd run at uh, Bullet last I seen him where he'd done well. So um, our condolences to his family and friends, and, and um, you know, it's, it's a sad loss. Yeah, I was hoping that we'd be many more episodes into the podcast before we have to talk about somebody passing away. But unfortunately, it happened here now. Yep. So that's um, that's pretty much all the cleanup from last weekend as far as uh, our last week's show. And okay. 
So, moving right along. All right. Well, this week, we're going to call it the pole position. It'll be the first uh, topic we talk about. And the first thing we got coming up is going to be the results from the Mid-American Hard Body Race. And you have those, right, Ron? Yeah, Mid-America, Mid-American Hard Body Series raced at Thaser Raceway in South Bend, Indiana this weekend. And they ran super stock and pony stock classes. And they had 23 for the super stock class. And when all the dust settled in that one, John Miller was your winner. Brian Meharry was second, and Austin Milchersko was third. Pony stocks, they had 17 entries. And your winner, first-time winner in the series, and maybe hard body race ever, uh, Dennis Clark. And second was Brian Meharry, and Austin Milchersko was third again. So um, they seem to have a – you know, it was a decent turnout for their series. And, and the Thaser track is uh, – Chris Dad's built, uh, they call it the White Knight course, but it's a hill climb and it's got a couple of kinks in it. Uh, so it's kind of a road course or road course-ish type track. So it's a little more difficult than a normal hill climb, but it's, it's a ton of fun to race on. I've raced there several times. I love that track, and they had a good time from what I could see on, on uh, Facebook. And the Mid-American Hard Body Series – also has a Facebook page, and if you want to know more about hard body racing and race results or whatever, whatever else is going on there, just go over their page on Facebook and like it and and start following it. Yeah. Um, second up, we had we told you guys about the FSCS and GER combo race that they held down in Florida at P1 Raceway for four inch NASCAR. They had 15 total entries. Uh, Mike Biscuit Brissett was first, Dennis DeMole was second, and raceway owner Marcus Ramos was third. And see, the top three cars are all within three laps, so it was a pretty tight race up front there. Yeah, I noticed, I noticed that the top six in that race was within, was within four laps, so that yeah. was pretty close. They had, they also raced, besides NASCAR, they also raced LMP. Looks like they had 13 combined in LMP. And Dennis DeMole won it with 252. Marcos Ramos was second with 250. And longtime Florida racing veteran and all around super nice guy, Terry Tawney, was third with 248. And the GER, the other half of the event was a GER retro race. And I know that they ran Can Am only, and Brian Ambrose was your winner. However, I don't have the rest of that podium, though. I wasn't able to find that. No, no, no information anywhere yet on that one. So, Okay. Now, speaking of close racing, we also had the uh, Hillbilly Hard Body Race at Tracy Browns on White House, Tennessee. And this was probably the closest race I've ever seen top to bottom. They had 26 total entries. Yep. Every single competitor in the race, now it's a nine-second breakout class, but every single competitor in the race turned a nine-second lap. The top seven cars were within less than one full lap. If you go all the way down to 20th place, the top 20 cars were within six laps. Incredible. Mike, yeah, Mike Loggins was your winner. Uh, Wally was second, and Paul Pedersen was third, and they were all within less than a lap. I think all three were on the same lap. I think they all had right. nine and some change. Yeah, and if you do the math, they run three-minute heats, and if you do the math with the breakout times and the amount of seconds you race in, in a race, the most laps you could possibly run is 160 laps. Right, right on the button. Yeah, and the winner won with 159 Point eight two laps so that is virtually a perfect um, race right no d slots no breakouts i mean that's as close as you get right so i think that's pretty awesome it was real awesome good job to all of them definitely okay and then um usra wing nets starts wednesday today um we don't have anything yet today on that because it's too early. California's three or three hours behind us, so nothing's come in yet. But on Monday, they ran two preliminary events, uh, International 15 Light and Cobalt 12 Light. 
And I, I believe the light designation means they're using steel chassis for those two classes or two races. They're not official USRA classes, but it's an idea to try. Um, maybe down the road it might put some popularity back into the class. Time will tell. But in the, in the 15 race, they only had four entries. TQ and the winner was Esteban from Brazil. Second was Richard Cernut, and third was Jason Holmes with Al Chuck in fourth. In the C12 race, they had six entries. Gary Pitts was TQ. Richard Cernut won. Esteban was second. Al Chuck was third. Rich Clark was fourth. Jason Holmes was fifth. And Gary Pitts was sixth. So on next week's show, those guys. The next week's show, we'll probably have a full USRA uh, national championship wrap up as far as who won in all the classes. Yeah. And speaking of next week's show, I think we might be able to give you guys our first guest next week too. Maybe. Yeah. That's something we're not, we're not going to tell you who we're working on. No, nope. but you definitely want to tune in. Cause I think you guys will like it if we can make it happen. Yep. Uh, we've been in talks with them and, and the, and the contracts have the lawyers. So everything needs to be signed and then he'll be on the show. So right. we'll see. Okay. So the uh, the last big race of the weekend was the Flexi Nasty uh, Flexi National Racing Series race, and we had that in Durham at Hobby Max RC Park, and both of us were there. Yep. So, kind of give me your rundown for your weekend as far as um, I know you'll give us the podiums, but then also go back and tell me. Uh, what happened to you and when you got there, you know, what'd you start with and kind of break down your weekend. Okay. So where do you want me to start? <laughs> go ahead and give, go ahead and give the overall results first. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. In LMP, we had 22 entries and, and Ralph was our TQ in the LMP class. Uh, Mike Parker won. <laughs> Ralph was second. Help me out here. Who was third? Robert Brantley? Yep. Yep. Robert Brantley was third. Mm -hmm. And, um, Mike won by two over Ralph, and, I, and Robert was just one behind you. I think he was one back, yeah. Yeah, he was real close. Very, t very tight race. Yeah. And then the NASCAR race, uh, Russ Martin was the TQ. Um, I, think he was kinda, I think he was very surprised he was TQ. I don't think he thought he was going to run as fast as he did. Because um, Mike Parker was on the pole for a while with like a 480, and then Russ came up wearing 478. So. Yeah. He bumped him off. And then um, in that race, Nick Brantley won, followed by um, Parker. Michael. Yep, Parker. Parker was second, and you were third. Correct. And uh, Nick won by just two in that, I think. Yeah, it was a, it was a fairly small margin, yeah. It was, another, it was another close race. And then in the GTP class, yours truly – I TQ'd, and um, I won over Nick Brantley, who was second, and Robert Brantley, who was third. And um, um, the GTP race was a fairly clean race. Um, at least for me it was. I, I think uh, I might have deslotted just twice myself. And then I don't know if it was you or Nick came off, and I stopped, and one of you guys – if you if you had come off, I stopped for you, and Nick come around and got both of us, or 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 Nick had stopped, and you there was just we got into a mugging right there. So <laughs> right, that was that was the worst thing I was in the whole race. Um, before I forget, I want to give Mike Parker a huge congratulations. Uh, Mike, not only did he win the LMP race, but he ran a perfect race with yes, zero these slots. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and what was cool about the LMP race was was Ralph and, and Mike, the first four heats of the race, they didn't run side by side per se, but they ran the same lap within a half a lap, and it depended on who was on what lane as far as some lanes were faster right. than others. And, but at the end of the fourth heat, the power went off, and, and Mike just coasted by Ralph by a few inches to, to take the lead, and then... And then the, the fifth heat started, and Mike was leading, and, and Ralph caught up to him. And, and Mike, in a super sportsman-like gesture, just let Ralph go. And Ralph went back into the lead. And then I think you came off a couple laps. That, and, yeah, I, I kind of rode behind him for like five or six laps, and, and he finally just said, okay, you go ahead. You know, you're a little bit faster. So 
I went by and we went down the straightaway and immediately into the dead man, I just, I dumped it. It's like it, right. it's like him letting me by just kind of threw off my timing a little bit. Right. But it was, you know? I just, you know, I, I, I never seen, well, Mike raced at the, at the race up at uh, Mark's model world in June, right. but you know, he, he wasn't in the a main and he wasn't fighting for the lead. And I, I was watching it and I'm thinking, okay, so are these two going to crash or, Someone gonna let someone go, and he let you go, and I just thought that was that was super smart on his part, and a super sportsman like move. Now I know yeah. if it was the last heat, ten seconds to go, that may not have happened, but right, you know. So, but that 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 would have been a racing deal too. So, yeah. And then, um, um, I, the big biggest shot I'm gonna give to is Wendell, or not Wendell, excuse me, Howard, the race director. I don't know Howard's last name. He, he told me his last name at, early in the day, and I forgot it, but he race directed all day, no problems, no hassles. Uh, it was just a super smooth show from, from that standpoint. I mean – Yeah, definitely one of, the, one of the best jobs I've seen. And as far as – I mean, he went out of his way to – you know, he didn't have to race direct. You know, no. He didn't have to do any no. of that. Right. You know, not only did he volunteer, he race directed, ran qualifying, entered all the names – uh, printed all our results, made any track pairs we yep. uh, needed, and the coolest thing was he went uh, he went out of his way above and beyond the Call of Duty yeah. to help out uh, James Johnson and build him a a platform to raise his chair up so Real James chair. can have a better line of sight while yeah. he's racing with us. He probably built a four inch riser and um, you know helped James for sure. And then at the end of the day, the best gesture was he, he, he gave it to him to right. know, take it. So, right. you know, James has something he can take to other tracks now, and if he needs it, he can use it. So, again, Howard, you know, just way, way beyond the call of duty. I mean, absolutely, super, super deal. And you know, I don't know what it cost him to build it or materials, but maybe he had stuff laying around. We don't know, but he had time and materials, and, you know, he, he gave it to James and – yeah, just, I mean, take the monetary aspect out of it. Just the right. fact that he took his time and went out of his way to do do something he didn't have right. to do for somebody he really didn't even know. And does Howard even race? Um, as far as I know, I was talking to him a little bit, and he mentioned that nowadays he really doesn't race anymore. Okay. He just kind of helps that out the track. And comes in always and still being in. around the hobby that way. Yeah, comes in, hangs out, and watches watches the show. And has total control. Yep. So, because prior to the race, I had heard some things that they had excessive track calls and stuff, but I never seen any of that. I mean, no, me either. all we had was, was right on spot. So, um, there wasn't no uh, funny track calls or no uncalled for track calls. So Yeah, I, I think during tech, I think maybe I rejected three cars all day. Maybe. Yeah, and and uh, most of them. Well, at the beginning of the day, they were too wide, and um, one or two was for numbers and and some wheel dots. Other than right. that, everybody just, passed just, through. And at yeah, the end of the just, FN, right at the end of the races and all the classes, because we have a spec pinion rule, um, the top three cars we pull the tire off and we count the pinion, make sure it's sixty four pitch, and make sure it's the correct number of teeth for the class and in and, and at all of our races so far no one has been out of spec so yeah and, and, and we don't really check that at tech um because uh, and everybody's been good so far as far as i can tell so yeah same here i definitely agree but as far as my as far as my experience um um, I had a great time. I mean, got to see a lot of people I hadn't seen for years. Got to see a lot of people I hadn't never met before from from that area. Um, there was a gentleman named George. Um, him and his son, um, new racers. They weren't racing. They came in to watch. And George came over and introduced himself and thanked us for the show. And um, George just his complaint or comment however you want to look at it. There's just not enough information out there for slot car racers or especially new slot car racers. So in the future, we're going to, we're going to work on that and we're going to change it up a little bit and, and 
we'll start doing some things and, and we'll let you know on the shows what we're, you know, when we do it and, and, and how we do it and where, where it'll be to view and stuff like that. So right. stuff like that's coming. So, but no, it was good to race with the, with the usual suspects that we normally race with from every other month or however soon or, you know, we see them. And, um, a lot, like I said, a lot of guys we hadn't raced with and, and I hadn't seen the Brantley's wow probably since they are one of the r4s early yeah, r4s maybe, maybe seven or seven or eight yeah six seven or eight years ago so yeah. it was good to race with uh with both of them i the first time i ever raced with robert but but nick i'd raced with at the r4 and and i beat him in a coupe race by a lap we had a super close race that day and you know he brought that up and we talked about it and we laughed and shared notes or whatever and um but the Brantleys are a super nice family and I got to meet Mrs. Brantley and, and she was super nice. And, uh, um, another shout out would go to Fred Yonkin's wife, Barbara, Barbara, who, who was our, uh, I don't want to call her our mother, but she was like our turn marshal for Friday. She, I don't know how many cars she put back. She on. was definitely a car chaser all day. She chased cars and put them yeah. on and, and, um, saved us a lot of footsteps. Yeah. And, um, and then when when Fred's turn when it was Fred's turn to marshal, she actually marshal. She was his substitute, so she did a super job. So big yeah. shout out to her. Um, another shout out to Casey Newbauer, who was there from Texas. I think he's working in that area, but he was our our farthest dis distance racer there from Texas. He races down at uh, Chantel Howard's Dallas Slot Cars, so it, it was good to see him. Um, uh, but my, you know, like I said, I never run on that track before. I'd only seen pictures of it. Um, that track was formerly known as the Beast of the East when Lusaconi owned it. Um, he had it custom built by Ogilvy apparently because the track has no name. So, right. Similar to an Engelman uh, in some ways, but in a lot of ways it's not. So so years ago when they had the Amsra Nats, USRA Nats on it, they just called it the Ogilvy 190-foot custom or not custom but 190 foot road course and it was the beast of the east and um lou eventually sold it it went down to sheaves uh raceway in uh, virginia i don't know city but it was in virginia i know that they ran some uh uh retro races there um um I think they did a lot of FCR racing too at the time, I believe. Yeah, because I think they were part of the national FCR series. Yeah, but yeah, so so um, they ran, I don't know, five or six retro races there, um, and um, I think they had decent turnouts for those races. But they didn't, other than the FCRs, they didn't have a whole lot of other racing action going on. Everyone, I guess, wanted to race either on their drag strip, which they still have, and they're still in business. And I guess they have two oval tracks. So, anyway, um, you know, I got there, got on the track, started pounding laps to learn the track. And um, parts of the track aren't that difficult. Um, the most difficult part to me was the dog leg. And I think that's probably the most difficult for everybody. And uh, the, the second most difficult is coming out of the bank into what you would call a dead man turn because you're just you're carrying so much speed going down there. So yeah, so the the dead man was definitely the trickiest part for me. And I know it gave I, you problems. I, in I didn't the GP race. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't find the kink really that hard to get through. I, I thought well, that was a pretty fun part. Well, the kink was hard at first, but but once I got my timing down, and and figured it out, and, and ran black lane to red lane because black lane's a lot tighter than red lane. So you had to have some discipline, like when you go to black, you just have to be real careful over there because it's so much tighter. And then to me, the most, where I found the most speed in the track was from the kink to the, the 180 past the kink, down the straightaway past the drivers, and then the second 180. And I ran a soft tire so I could get a good bite coming out of there, so no wiggle, and, and I just had good forward bite. Carried all that momentum into the 180, hit it real quick, and hit the other eight real quick because you went into the sweeper turn, which all the lanes you just held wide open, and you went on to the straightaway. Yeah. So even with that, I would still at times find myself blipping that sweeper turn because <laughs> there's a turn there. It's a natural action to be blipping for it. Right. So 
Yeah. In practice, I had like, I kept telling myself, just punch it, punch it, punch it. So, and in an LMP and NASCAR though, you do have to, you do have to blip that. Oh, so I'd been better off racing those two classes. All right. Okay. <laughs> and then in the, in the 180 out of the dog leg, coming out of the dog leg under the bridge is 180. Some of those lanes, you could hold it wide open. You could punch it like the outside lanes, which would be red, white, green, orange, and blue and yellow and purple and black. It was, it was a quick blip for me. I mean, I guess if, if you're, maybe your car was a little slower in that part of the track, maybe you could punch it on some of the lower lanes. I don't think no one could do it on black or purple, but um, maybe with GTPs, you could do yellow or blue, but I had difficulty doing it on orange and qualifying was, was interesting because I was close to being on the pole and then I didn't know how much time I had, but I, I, but I was running out and I just like said, you know what, screw it. And I went through there and I, and I, I just barely knocked Nick off the pole. So I, I wound up with the pole in GTP. And I think if Nick had run my car or one of the locals, somebody got around, Nick definitely gets around the track good. And, and yeah, Mike definitely. Parker and some other, you know, if those guys had run my car, it might have even been faster than when I made it go. But we'll never know. Yeah, because I think I think when you clicked off that fast lap, I, I think the timer shut off like instantly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was like the pole lap and off instantly. Well, and I think too, like even though I I punched it through there, I still messed up the other half of the track, like the 180 coming or the dead man in the second 180 which I guess they probably call a finger. Right. I think I kind of messed up those two turns, but I definitely got through the kink in the, in the, in that 180 to clip that, to get that good lap in. So, right. I never put together a perfect lap. I'll put it that way. Yeah. So, um, the track for me, like softer tires, um, small hubs, um, in GTP, I gave Ralph a car, and Ralph gave me a set of tires. And he used uh, he had mounted some yellow jacket donuts that he sells on a real tiny metal hub. And I hadn't I didn't have anything like that. And and he he'd give me a pair to try um, before the last practice session, and I never tried them. And then he said, "Did you try those tires?" And I said, "No." So I gave them back to him, and he went over and went real fast. And I said, "You got another pair of those?" <laughs> And he says, yeah, so I threw him down real quick, and I went out and ran sec I ran two laps. In the second lap, I'd run 338, which I was the that's the fastest I'd run all day. So it was like, yeah, I'm ready to tech. So in the race, I started on white, and um, I came off, I guess, in the turn past the driver's stand. And... Uh, Still managed to keep the lead. Went to red with the lead, kept the lead. I, I mean, I led flag to flag. I mean, I had, like I said, I had a pretty super clean race. Car was good. I drove decent. And, um, you know, the, the track was great, I thought. I mean, I heard yeah, the stories, but I yeah, didn't the, have any problems with it. Yeah, the track was good. I think you kind of touched on a problem that a lot of people had and a lot of people had that they didn't know they were having. And, um, and that's the, you know, that track, you really got to have a lot of forward bite to get around that track. Well, fast, well, and the, and the track was pretty slimy on Friday due to all the humidity. I mean, right. It was air conditioned, but there was still a lot of humidity in the building. And, and when the right. humid inside, it makes the track slimy. And I was pretty hooked up. And I, I knew the track, or I felt the track would get better Saturday. And it did, and it got better after each class. And it, and the, I'm not going to say the track was stuck, but it was definitely better by the time we ran GTP yeah. than it had been because some lanes I felt uh, not stuck, but, but, but definitely there was more stick going in turns because I'd find myself letting up where I had been and the car was stopping too short. So I just had to right. drive in deeper. But not all the lanes were the same. So that, that I had just – two things about this race. I never adjusted my controller the whole race, which is a rarity. And the second thing was I never even turned on my soldering iron the entire weekend I was there. So wow. 
I didn't do any motor changes. I mean, I was, I was pretty prepped, but I had six cars together and I ran through all six, same tires on them, got down to two car to my two best cars and then turned one car just into a practice car. Right. And I kept using that after every race to go out and see what, if the track was getting stickier or it was looser or the same. Right. And then, um, that, that car, I thought it was slow. I mean, it, we gave it to James Johnson to run, and he went almost, well, he went almost in the A main with it. I mean, that car was like, <laughs> right. it picked up like three tenths from the last time I ran it to when he qualified. And I, and, but everybody picked up time when they qualified GTP from what they practiced. A lot of guys picked up he, huge yeah. amount of time. He just missed the A main, but he was like within a tenth of full time, though. You know, so that gives you an idea how. No, he's not a tenth, a thousandth or two. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's yeah. all right. So, yeah, but that just gives you an idea how tight the how tight that field was. Yeah, because because the the top six in the A main were a tenth apart in qualifying. Yeah. Where like in stock cars, the top six was two tenths apart. And in LMP, I think the top six there was a tenth, a, a tenth within a tenth. So. Right. I think the big difference too is LMP and GTP are a little closer because the bodies have more downforce than a stock car body. Yeah. So yeah. it's not so much about the motors. It's about getting your car hooked up. Yeah. I know for me, um, I picked up my racing buddy, traveling partner, James Johnson. Uh, he came by and picked me up Thursday morning and it's about an eight hour ride from where we are just Southeast of Atlanta up to Durham. So, I think we rolled in about four o'clock or so, kind of got unloaded, settled in, picked our pit spot. And then it was basically for me, it was just start going through uh, motors, trying to find a uh, motor that ran with the 13 pinion and trying to find one that ran with the 10. But, they, the, uh, but the question is, did you find one motor that ran good with both pinions? No, I did not. I did okay. not. My, and they ran – there's a difference in good or in being the best. Right. And there was somebody life. had posted that, that somebody had run the same motor – well, actually the same car. They just changed the pinion in the body. Yeah, I think that was Russ Martin. And it was fast with both pinions on it. Yeah. And, and, and that's another thing about when you said if it was Russ Martin, Russ Martin for some reason didn't qualify well in LMP, and he was in the B main. Yeah. And, and he was uh, – if he wasn't leading, he was right there on the same lap. And then yeah. he broke a guide flag. and um, But he he ran the fastest lap of the entire LMP field in the B main. So I think, had he not broke, he could have been probably in the top three for sure. Yeah. And, um, yeah, he was rolling until the, until the guide flag. But we'll talk more about the guide flag and some yeah. of the problems when it came to changing his guide flag. Yeah. So I just try to get my motor situation sorted out Thursday and that, you know, basically everything I got done Thursday was just a head start and one less thing I had to, I had to do Friday, you know? Right. So by the, before Thursday night was over, I found my stock car motor. So Friday morning when I went in, I just had to go in and find an LMP motor. Um, but like you alluded to, the track started, you know, it was really humid and the track kind of started to get a little greasy and it was something that I didn't really notice was happening. And, you know, because your car gets, you know, the back end comes out a little bit, you know, oh, yeah. but it didn't, it didn't seem any worse or abnormally bad, you know? Right. So I just kept the tires that I had on, on the car and just kept trying motors and trying motors. And I found my best one. And then I went back to and, and put my NASCAR motor in to, to tune the car now, you know, right. and I was like nowhere. I was like, I was probably uh, four ten easily four tenths off of what I was the day before with the same motor, same car, everything. Right. And that just shows you how big of a difference tires can make. Right. And, because, because like on Friday night, you know, I, I ran all my cars with one set of tires. And, you know, basically I had some cars that went four sixes, which at that time Friday was fast. You know, I mean, that was real fast to go four sixes with a GTP car. So then when I went over and said, okay, I'm going to grind two pair of this and two pair of that and went out, 
Well, then just changing tires, I picked up over a tenth. I mean, I went from running 465, right, running 453, 452, just by changing tires. And I mean, I knew that I felt that you know I definitely needed a softer tire and a smaller hub Friday night, and and I did. So so yeah, it was and and, and then keeping up with the track or keeping up with the tires was was the next thing. Yeah. So, even though I got to a point, it was hard to believe that that small hub, that real tiny hub that we ran, would have been the best but it turned out to be the best. And, and what I know is a lot of guys, I think a lot of guys this weekend ran the wrong tire, either too hard, um, whether it was, I mean, some guys were running Wonder Rubber, which I don't even know how they were getting around with that. Yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. Yeah. I know it would never work for me. Um, and, you know, like you said about, when the track is slimy like that, you can be loose and you don't realize it because your car doesn't really kick out. Yeah, you're just you, – you might not even realize you're loose, but right. you're just slow, you right. know. Your car wiggles. And I noticed tons of guys coming out of the, the dog leg and just windshield wiper in a little bit. And when and when you're doing that, you're not getting traction. You're not getting forward. Yeah. You're losing time. Right. Where if you come out and go straight, you're picking up time. And a lot of guys are really loose coming – Coming through that 180. Coming you're right through the low – I call oh, it a low bridge. bank. You call it the 180, yeah. 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 What do you call it? I call it the, a low bank. Okay, yeah, low Because it's a little, little less bank than the high bank, you know. Right. Yeah. I mean, like I told you Friday night after I ran, I said, this is, this is just a real fast road course. Because right. so mainly flat. I mean, the sweeper turn is elevated, but it's not banked, you know. Yeah. So – and, and you got the big bank, but I mean, the dead man's not really banked, and neither is the what I call the finger. They're fairly yeah. flat, but you it, know, it was a, a real fast flat track. Yeah, and a, and a lot of people get caught up with bank speed, and they just they just get blinded by bank speed, and they right. think if they got bank speed, that their car is going to be fast. You know, oh. they put that Wonder Rubber on there, the hard tire on. And they just smoked everybody down the straightaway. They're the they're the first from the lead, lead on to the dead man, but once they get to the dead man, right, you're nowhere. And you see know, that track got to have forward bite. And that track is 190 foot long, and I'm gonna guess that the between the straightaway and the bank is probably only 60 feet. Yeah, I would. I was gonna guess 70, but somewhere okay, between 70. There, yeah. So I mean, 120 feet then of track. Is, is basically turns. <laughs> right, right. Okay? If you can't hook up in the turns, it don't, it don't matter how fast you go down straight away. Right. So the, my question to you is how many times did you change your bat pan or bat pans? Oh, um, um, man, I, I, if, I had dollar, if I had a dollar for every time I did, I, I'd, I'd be retired and off the podcast. Um, you know, I, I went, from, went from the aluminum pan to the um, – like the, the medium middle of the road pan and then the heavy pan. And then I tried them all again. And this time I taped them up and I mean, I just kept cycling through them. You know, if, when, if I found a set of tires, I thought I liked better. I'd swap the pans on that again. Um, you know, and the, I got my stock car to go. The pull speed was a, like a 478. Right. Um, I got mine to go a 472 with a woman in pan. Yeah, in practice. Or, yeah. yeah, in practice. But I just decided with my with my inexperience on the track and with the amount of speed my car had in it, I could afford to give up, uh, which was roughly like a tenth of a second by running the heavy steel pan um, because I just wanted a little more consistency consistency out of my car. Right. And, you know, I just needed a, I just needed a little bit of help not having the track time that a lot of those guys had on there. Because I know Nick Brantley – now, did you run a Patriot or Defender in stock car? You know, I, man, you know, I tested, I tested uh, Patriots and Defenders, and you know, the Defender never felt bad. But then when I put the tires and gears and motor and body onto the Patriot, the Patriot was like maybe a tenth quicker. Okay. So, you know, it's not that the not that the Defender felt bad, 
but for some reason the Patriot was just a little bit quicker for me. Right, because I know Nick Nick won with a Defender with aluminum pan, and right. um, uh, Mike won LMP with the with the JK forty three, and that and that had a metal pan. So it seemed like in in LMP and stock car guys were kind of going more on the heavy side than the lighter side. Yeah. And, now, in LMP, I ran the aluminum pan though. At stock, right. at stock okay. I ran the heavy. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. You did run. Yeah. I seen you ran the aluminum pan, and then GTP. I think. Well, in GTP, I mean, I ran the Defender with aluminum pan, and Nick and Robert ran JK forty threes with steel pans. So, and then after that, well, yeah, because after that, I think six of the top eight all had either Patriots or Defenders with aluminum pans on them. Yeah, the, it was really a it was really a complete mixed bag. I mean, I don't think I've right. ever seen such a mixed bag. Well, it in goes a long back time. To, well, it goes back to being a road course, right? It goes back to more of a yeah, road course than the track. Speedway. Yeah, you know, in, in the in my case, the Defender versus the Patriot. That's just another one of those things where, you know, I never felt the Defender was bad at all, and. If I would have never tried a Patriot, I would have I would have left that speed on the table, you know. So it just goes back to same thing with with the motors and the tires and the bodies. I mean, you just got to test. You got you know if if you don't try, you'll never learn, you know. And tape on and tape off. Yeah. You did a lot of a lot of taping. Yeah. Some back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know. And yeah. depending on what pan you ran and. I mean, what worked with aluminum pan tape-wise didn't work with a metal pan. Right, exactly. So, I mean, it, it, it was Friday night thrashing at its finest. Yeah. And, and see, for me, you know, taping, taping the center section and the pan together, locking down the movement, that always makes my cars a little bit looser. Is that what you find it does to yours? No, I actually think the tape makes – I don't want to say it makes it – tighter but i to me it feels like it plants the car better especially like okay. in a top turn on a king track or something okay it just it just feels like i mean the first time i ran the defender was several months ago up at fort wayne i had a tough time getting through the top turn i had no tape on it so I'm like, you know what let's put a piece of tape on it so i put a piece of tape on it man then i could hook through there but that was the only place that made the car feel different was the top turn so but it just felt like the nose was more planted to come around the top turn. And, and for, all, or for all the listeners, when you say top turn, that's what most people refer to as the lead on, right? Yeah, lead on top turn. Okay, yeah. okay. Yes. All right. So, yeah, that's, that's where I always felt the tape. That's where I felt the tape felt best or better for me. Okay, um, okay. And, and, and it, it could be a couple of thousandths or some days it could be half a tenth or a tenth. Right. The tape is something, something definitely you have to try. Right. Or, or, some, or some days it's – it's nothing. Right. You know, right. so, but That's it's, right. it's one of the easiest and cheapest things there is to test. So why right. not try it? You know? Right. And another thing I noticed too, like, like in, in uh, Friday night, I, I, I ran the B3 body, but I tried the Cadillac body and it was really loose, but it was a lot shorter body. And, yeah. you know, me and you talked about a longer body for LMP and you ran the Audi, which is kind of a middle, medium length body. Right. The guys that ran good, I think in all the class, except for stock car, I mean, it's only one length of body there, but in LMP and GTP, everybody that had long bodies did the best. And I, in GTP, I don't think, I think it was either my body or your body. I mean, I don't think there was any other, you know. I don't think anybody in the field had anything. Right. You know, so yeah. and those are both those are both long bodies or longer bodies compared right. to Cadillac, right? Yeah. So I mean, and, and usually a Cadillac, I can go to that, and it's usually close to a Bentley or a B three, but not this weekend. It was yeah. way off. Did you uh, try one of your Mercedes bodies by any chance? I had at one. All? I had one, but usually the Cadillac Nothing. better than the Mercedes, and it, and, I, and I'll be honest, if the Cadillac's loose, the Mercedes is going to be looser. <laughs> right. Right. Okay? Yeah. So it's like. I didn't even try it. Yeah. I just like kind of run the Cadillac at time. If the Cadillac's good, I'll run it because I don't have to tape an interior in it. Right. And whereas the other body's got to put an interior in. Not worried about the weight or anything. It's just a hassle. Because didn't your interior fall out in the GTP race? 
Yeah, it came out. I had to put it back in between heats. Yeah. So, you know, no one too. I mean, it's just this tiny little man, you know, but. You have really said you got to have it. Came out, you know. He No, he ejected. He was scared. Yeah. Well, he he had, he had gone for – he had been in the car for a couple races. I think his, oh. the, his tape stickum was wearing off. So. Yeah, he said, here's a stapler. Yeah. So – but I had mine stapled, and so it wasn't going to fall out. So, other than that, I mean, you know, again, and then I got to give a shout-out to Pete Reams and Anthony Brown and, and Teddy Hoots, who, who kind of work hand-in-hand hand there at the race. Yeah. And Howard. For sure. Well, I already got yeah. Howard, but yeah. but uh, yeah, those three guys. I mean, you know, with Pete running the, the Triangle Slot Racers Association, uh, and they have a pretty good group of racers. I mean, it, you know, them guys told me they were a little disappointed with the turnout because there were some guys there that they thought were going to be there that weren't there. And we never know why people don't show up. I mean, is it because better racers are coming in, or is it because we race on Tuesdays but we can't race on Saturdays, or was the weather nice, or did something come? I mean. You never know. You never know what you're going to get. But I thought right. I thought we were going to. This might have been the biggest race we'd had so far. It wasn't, but it was right up there with the rest of them. I mean, I'm more than happy with the turnout. So, yeah, same here. You know, um, if we'd had more, great. We just would have got done a little later, but not a big deal either. So, yeah. Well, I thought it was nice too that we all could kind of get together. We had time to get together and and go out to eat after the race. So, yeah, well, that was fun because too. that was the first time I'd ever been offered metal or plastic utensils to eat with. Yeah, and then don't forget about the uh, children's cups. Children's cups with, all <laughs> with, with lids and, yeah, right. Yeah. And I say drinks. We went to a non-alcoholic establishment, so yeah. it was Pepsi and coffee and whatever, water, all, in, all in plastic cups with lids. Kitty cups. Yeah. Uh, you know, I should have asked her when she said plastic or – metal for the utensils i should have said china or paper for the plates <laughs> right <laughs> yeah that's that's definitely the first time that i've been to an ihop and was offered plastic silverware understaffed for sure so, um overworked uh lack of management i mean the food was good but where else were we gonna go cupcake pancakes were fantastic we'll go to the exxon no, we're not going to the Exxon ever again. <laughs> which, which, by the way, I forgot to cash in my winning lottery oh, ticket before I left the state. Rob <laughs> so, ticket, and he won two two dollars. Two not million, but two dollars. Just, just two bucks. Now we're the two dollar network. We got he give me a dollar, and we can keep going another week. <laughs> okay, so um, I had touched about uh, um. Russ Martin and his problem in the LP race. And Russ Martin uh, broke a guide flag, and um, he, he went over to change it, and I walked over because I, I kind of thought it was taking him a long time to change his guide flag. Or, and I didn't know if he was getting back in the race. So I walked over to see if he was getting back. He says, yeah, I'm going to get back in after I get my guide flag changed. So when it comes to lead wires on guide flags, um, most guys run clips and solder the lead wires on top of the clips. Years ago, when Starburst came out with uh, the graphite guide, that had slots in the top uh, top deck that you could lay your lead wires down in and solder them to half a guide clip. Like the guide clip would be held in with a braid and you'd solder to it. And a lot of guys would glue them up in there. And that's really that was really good back in the wing car days or wing car days today even because – you your you can lower your your body lower in the front. Now with, with what we're running, that's not an issue because everything has clearance for for lead wires and guide clips. Right. So so basically, this is what Russ. That's the setup he ran. Um, lead okay. wire soldered to half a clip. Okay, and the only problem is that when you break your guide, you have to unsolder your lead wires to get that guide off the car. That also seems real dangerous, um, especially if you have average or below average soldering skills or the wrong tip on your soldering iron. It seems right. like you could really just melt a guide fly quick doing that. Right. And, and then, you know, most guys, like I said, they were on the clips, which in this situation, you pull the braid out, the clip comes out, you change the guide, put the clips in, put your braid back in, 
and, and you're going. But, right. but again, in this deal, hold that up there. You have to unsolder them. And I don't know how he, I don't know how he had his second guide set up. I don't know if it had the, had half clips or what. So I don't know, or maybe he decided to get clips out and solder onto clips, but yeah, he was off the track a long time. I mean, what, what kind of guide flag did he break? And do you know how it broke or where it broke? Okay. I don't know. I, again, I didn't see, I didn't see the hit. Mm, I heard that either, you know, guide flags broken. And I went over, and it was a red fox guy that it broke. And I asked him if he had boiled it, and he said no. But it snapped the post off, or sheared okay. the post off. And they had to go through that hassle. Excellent. So then he put on a Parma guide. That was his replacement guide. And he went out and finished the race. And like I said, he ran, he ran the fastest lap of the race and overall after he changed guide flags. And he put a Parma guide flag on the car. So, you know – the, the hot topic these days, Red Fox guide is supposedly f way faster than any other guide. Right. In, in my personal testing, when we were at the, the Race of Champions race back in July, yes, the Red Fox guide was faster on my retro Can-Am car. Don't know about F1. I went ahead and put one on there anyway. But I, I basically in Can-Am, I started with a, a, Parma, a Parma or Cahosa guide. I don't remember which. And I ran my car. And, and then Bob Dempsey, he had a, a Parma guide on his car, and we ran them. And, and then it got to a point I said, hey, Bob, let's, let's just change guides and see if it makes a difference. So I ran his car. You know, uh, I, think he, I think I ran uh, 405 or 40, 402 is what I ran with his car. Took the car off the track, turned around, changed the guide flag, put it back on the track and went 390. And that's and this, all changed. He drove. This is on a modern King track, right? Yeah. This was on girding 13 or 14. Okay. So then he drove the car and it was a 10th faster for him. So then I ran my car and I was running 392, took it off, changed the guide, put it back on and I went 384. Okay. Just changing the guide flag. Now with my flexi car, and doing some testing down at Tri-State a few weeks back, I went there and I had the Parma guide on my car, and I ran, and I and you know I went like I don't know, three forty, oh three fifty one. Went over, changed the guide, went right back to the track. I mean we're not even talking two minutes, so it's not like the track changed or someone ran your lane. Right. Put it on, and I went three thirty nine. So I picked up two thousand. So I'm like. That's not worth five bucks. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. For the retro car, I picked it up. Now, the only thing I haven't tested down there at Tri State is, and, and I'll do that, um, is go there with a Red Fox guy, take it off, put the Parma guide on, and see if it slows down. Okay. But, but on a flexi car, I didn't notice at 2000 is all I got. And I've had other people tell me flexi cars, they have seen no gain. And then I've had a few people say they have seen. I mean, I think at Mark's model where you said you didn't see any gain between another guide and the Red Fox on your flexi cars. Yeah, it was about the same for me. Right. Um, now, now I did run the Red Fox on my GTP car because that's the guy I put on when I was testing, and that car just went around so good that I just left it together. And but I had the car you ran was just as fast as that car per se. I had a Parma on it. it. Had a, yeah, it had a Parma guide. So. And, you know, I sat there before the race and I thought I should, I should probably change this guide. Like I don't, I don't trust it enough, but I thought, no, I'm going to leave the car together. Cause I didn't want to like change it and have it go slower or something. I mean, it may have gone faster. My loss of it would have went faster. I don't know. I just left it <laughs> you together. Never know, yeah. And I was like, you know, if I hit someone and it breaks, that's on me because I had the option to do all that and I didn't do it. But I had boiled my guides and, and, and suggest that to other people. And I didn't hit anybody this hard enough. I didn't hit anybody hard enough this weekend to break a guide. Okay. Like, in uh -huh. the, or in practice, but. And, and I did actually, I, I broke, broke one. A guide. Yeah. It box. didn't, it didn't shear at the post, but it, it split where the braid and the 
clip go in and just right. kind of split right down the side. And that's another problem with guide flags I'm, and all brands too is just split. Yeah. Here. But but I blow my guides and, and, and I'll tell all you, um, and you can do this with any nylon guide. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it less brittle and more pliable. Um, basically what I do is I get a metal can, maybe an old coffee can, or you can use a, 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 a boiling pot or pan or whatever. I put my guide flags in the pan. I fill it about halfway up with water. Um, and I, and I use, I don't know, maybe a four inch diameter thing. So I, I guess maybe I got three to four inches of water in there. I put it on the stove. I turn it on high. This electric stove, but anyway, um, turn it to 10. When, when the water starts boiling, then I time it for 20 minutes. 20 minutes, I turn the heat off. I just let it cool down to room temperature before I take the guides out of the, out of the water. No guide issues. What I notice is they're easier to thread, and they are more pliable if you kind of tweak on them. Or, or, so they're a little more pliable. And, um, you know, we did that for years with associated guides. Then the graphite guides came out, and, and, and boiling won't do anything to graphite. Uh, the Parma guide is sold as a graphite guide, but it's a nylon guide because it threads just like a nylon guide. If you, if you thread a graphite guide, they're very difficult. The Red Fox guide unboiled is more difficult than that. And so you, you need to boil the guide. If you're going to run a Red Fox guide, I think you need to boil it. And I think if you boil it, you don't need a pin guide um, because, because they snap because they're brittle. If you can get them to not be brittle, you don't need to pin them in, and they're not going to break as easy. I mean, guides will still break because they're plastic, but um, in boil your Parma guides, and, and, if, and, and if you're running, uh, I'm trying to think what other nylon guides are out there. Some There's some Cohosa guides out there, I think, or anything that's... Uh, yeah, I've seen some Cohosa ones that were. Yeah, anything that's like a color other than graphite. You can definitely tell graphite from nylon. Because yeah. you can't dye gray. It's, you know, if it's yeah. black, it's plastic. It's nylon. Boil it. Yeah, I've, I've seen Cohosa ones in red and purple, I think. Yeah, yeah. Was that was that a Cohosa that you showed? That's a Cohosa. That's like an old, old Cohosa. That's a Cohosa that's not, uh, not threaded or anything. Yeah, it's just a regular old guide, so. Okay. But that's nylon. Yeah, I, I, ordered, I ordered some boiled pinned uh, guide flags earlier today, actually. So I'm going to give them a shot, see what happens. I'm going to try them out, you know. Right. I, th I think the biggest thing, like you said, is is the boiling more than the pinning to me. Right. You know. And I think a lot of people are, are damaging their guides when they, um, when they actually thread them. Yeah. And when you thread the guide, and that, that'll be a video or something we'll get on here in a week or two, but I always start to thread and go one thread slow, back it off, half a turn, go down a quarter, back it off a half, go back down another quarter, back it off. Because you want to, you, as you're threading, you're, you're creating a string of, of nylon, and you need to break that off and get it out of there. And just right. go down, back it off, go just back clean, down, back it just off. Just clean up the threads a little yeah, bit. Yeah, clean up the threads as you're backing it off. Right. There's some other things I do, but like I said, I, I'll make a video and we'll, we'll go deeper into this. But right. when you're guiding those, those, or threading those guides, you just need to take your time and, and not twist that post when you're threading. Yeah, because if you snap one of those guide flags, anybody who's ever done that knows that that is a pain to try right. to get out of a guide flag threader. Yep. If you even can get it out. Right. Oh, I've got a, I've got a threader here that uh, I, never, I was never able to get the graphite out of it. I broke a graphite. Right. I mean, I heated up with a soldering iron, threw it in the oven, heated up. I just could never get it, never get it there. Never get it, never get it to be usable again. No. So, um, the other only thing I wanted to touch on a little bit was like the body clip deal. Some guys run body clips, some guys run pin tubes. Um, I don't know if there's any advantage to either one. I think it's personal preference. Um, I always run pin tubes because I'm just used to pin tubes. I mean, I, you know, I was used to the body clips years ago because that's what we ran on everything. Um, body clips without tape will definitely give your car or your body more up, down, 
movement. It doesn't really change the flex. Or float, basically. So, but, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, years ago we joked because I, I had a four and a half inch stock car that had clips. And sitting on the track, the body would be level. When I accelerate, the trunk would, you know, the back end would go down, the front end would come up. So we call it the moonshine car because it looked like you were <laughs> something in the back. Yeah. And, and um, but if you tape, but once you tape the clips, then that you controlled that. So I think with, with pin tubes, I think there might be, you might get more downforce to the chassis because those tubes are, are solid to the chassis. They're soldered in or with the new aluminum pans without plating or anodized, you need epoxy them in. There's no, there's no uh, movement. I mean, it's just a direct, a direct pressure point. Where with body clips, if they're not taped, you've got some movement before you're actually pushing the body down on the pan then creating downforce that way. So, again, you know, I just see a lot of guys are running clips and a lot of guys are running – and I know you like clips. Yeah, I, pre I prefer clips just because the ease – because I take the body on and off, on and off, constantly testing, changing things. Right. And I can just – I can unclip a body in two seconds or less. And when I put my new, you know? my new chassis together, I actually bought some body clips – and I weighed the body clips, and I weighed the tubes and the pins, and there was no difference in weight. I mean, we're not even talking a tenth of a gram if there was any difference. So it was kind of like there's no advantage weight-wise. So run what you, what's your personal preference, I guess. Yeah, I and mean, it's just, like I said, it's just so much easier to get the body on and off for me. So because so. that's all you've done, basically. Yeah. You know, the, um, uh, speaking of bodies, another thing that I noticed – and I've noticed for years is the uh, lack of body reinforcement that people use. And, you know, in the FNRS series, we're running a four inch stock car and it seems like notoriously through the year, stock cars have always been the worst for sucking up bodies in the back. Well, because, because everywhere else we always had to run rear bumpers. Right. We had all that back there, and, and guys didn't put big enough openings, and that back end would hit the wall and get bent down and then just suck in the suck, top. Suck right in, yeah. Right. So I use double-sided, uh, like sand with double-sided tape on it, just your right. standard body reinforcement. And, you know, I always put a piece. If I, if I don't put it vertically, I'll put it uh, horizontally, depending on the body right. or the body will let me put it. Right. But, you know – Basically, it's you know, it's cheap insurance. You know, right. why why risk not running any? Why risk not finishing the race? And B, personally, I think it actually makes the car a little bit faster because I don't like the back end of my cars to squat down like that, right? And because they can rub on the tires or the motors. Um, you know, I like the back of the body to be held up in place where it's supposed to be, right. Right. So, and, and, and I think, you know, I, I reinforce my bodies a lot different than you have been. So yeah, this weekend. So that's another video that probably next week I'll do because I got to mount some bodies anyway. So I can just okay. set up the camera on the tripod and hopefully get everything in the frame. And, and we'll talk more about that. Cause I even use different thicknesses of body armor to tune my bodies because some tracks you want them to, yeah. To move around a little bit more in the back than other tracks, so yeah. it makes a big difference in the, in the thickness of the body armor and the length of it and the placement of it. So I just try and stay consistent and run the same width and the same spot on all the bodies and just change the thickness of the body armor. Yeah, same same here. It, you know, I think I touched on this last week. It's just consistency. You know, no matter what you do, just do it consistently. Right. Um, you know, I, I've reinforced my my body clip holes, I've taped my body clips, and I've reinforced the back of my bodies the exact same way for at least the last 12 years. Right. And I don't think there's anybody listening to the show that can ever recall a race where I didn't finish a race because of my body once right. I started doing it right. Right. And especially, like, well, in FNRS, because we don't have a rear body height, we can run our bodies a little higher and get them away from the tires. But some places you have to run them an inch and five eighths. So you get the body closer to the tires, you increase that risk of 
getting it smashed and sucking in by either a turn marshal or hitting a wall or something. So you gotta, you gotta run body reinforcement. Um, definitely. Definitely. I mean, and, and like I said, I'll, I'll make a video here in the next week or so and we'll get that up and hopefully more of you guys will, will learn and, and see. Yeah. We go from there. All right. Anything else you want to touch on this week? No, I think we were going to talk about some guide history, but we can do that another show when we get back into guide flags. I mean, we're just going to go through the, through the, through the manufacturers of guides and what came out and, you know, where, where it's to today. So, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to hear your perspective um, and take on the history of flexi cars too. Oh yeah. One, well, one week on a show. That was another viewer yeah. comment. We need to talk about the evolution of the flexi car. So yeah. that's going to take a little research cause I got to dig in the vault and pull out chassis and maybe find some pictures of stuff I don't have. And we'll just go from the beginning right up to today and talk about all of them. And that, that'll that probably be just a whole one hour show right there, so. All right, question, question of the week. Question of the week, for me what is the, them? Yep, for you, for so me. tell them. What is the, uh, what's the secret word of the show? The secret word this week, I hadn't thought about it. I thought about it and I was gonna to talk to you and I forgot about it. So let's just say the secret word is winner. Winner. All right. Right there on Ralph's shirt, winner. There you go. Winner, winner. Sure. Chicken dinner. So type that in if you've got this far. And I think we went over our time again, but yeah. not so much this week. All right. Well, if that's all you got, that's all I got. All I got and the checkered flag is waving on episode two. Make sure you guys tune in next week, episode three. And like I mentioned earlier, we're going to try to have a guest on. I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. Okay, and Ralph, find find that lottery ticket and get that two bucks. <laughs> I will. I'm, I'm on it. Go buy two more tickets to the Exxon, and maybe you can get you a dinner at IHOP with plastic utensils. I'm on it. All right. Thank you, guys. See you next week. Good night, and have a great week, and be safe. <laughs>